your pioneer days were helping Chicago Board of Trade really uh, uh, experience this first, what, on-screen kind of digital, yeah. digital uh, experience. Yeah, you did your research. That was in 1995, uh, U.S. <laughs> Treasury and... Well, we share uh, a little bit of... Uh, uh, I mean, I... Electronic trading overtook Chicago Board of Trade, and I started on the floor of Chicago Board of Trade for Bloomberg back in 2008. Do you remember that year? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> As I'm sure we all do. Um, but now, you know, fast forward. We're in a, a space that uh, blockchain has created, um, that 2008 created, uh, at that traditional markets, one could argue, created. And now there's a, a digital asset market that's really kind of taken fervor. You heard from Ashley, you're, you're hearing more and more from policymakers. How does this help blockchain for enterprise solution in finance? I'll start with you, David. Okay, so uh, I told uh, Yuval while we were sitting here, I know more about exchange trading than I do uh, blockchain, so I'm, <laughs> I'm in my comfort zone. So, you know, we need, in order for this market to grow up, we need regulatory certainty and you know, it's, it's a start. Um, a couple of the, you know, we had the good fortune of listening to a part of his speech. You know, a couple of the things laid out there I think are going to be difficult in the short run. But uh, importantly, I come, I'm a Series 7, 24, 63. I owned a broker dealer until Friday. I just sold one. So I, I come from that background, and I've been amazed at the Wild West that has been ICOs over the last six years. In my opinion, it's going to historically be reflected upon as, as one of the biggest uh, frauds ever. Um, but, you know, the regulators are finally catching up, and I do think that we're going to have this, uh, you know, everybody's talking about the tokenization of, of assets now. We're going to have responsible trading on regulated exchanges of digital assets in the future. So, good start. Well, you've all, you are based in New York, you're uh, expanding here across Asia, uh, you've got an office here in Hong Kong, you're helping businesses think about enterprise solutions for finance. What are those conversations like? Is it easier to have these conversations now? What is, are we getting to a level of sophistication of knowledge of, dare I say, maturity? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, I agree with what David said, and I think just to touch on the previous point, I think that a lot of people in this space talking about how you bank the unbanked, and I think that a lot of that is happening is taking advantage of the unbanked. So I think that bringing regulation, like David said, the certainty is extremely important. But to your question, I think that uh, what we're seeing is that we don't need to have conversation of explaining what is cryptography, how do you chain these blocks together? It's more about how does that transform my business and how do I get into production, which are actually the conversations that you want to start having with businesses. So I think four or five years ago when, when we all entered uh, this space in earnest, I think it was a lot of education. I think today you're actually seeing more concrete questions of how do I start using it? Yeah. yeah so Blockchain is, uh, at its base, uh, a trust foundation, a, a trust platform uh, from a maximally decentralized or a significantly decentralized uh, base, uh, you get this trust characteristic. The trust characteristic can manifest in digital scarcity. Uh, from that, you get cryptocurrencies and different kinds of assets, or it can manifest in trusted collaboration. And so the blockchain space is essentially bifurcated in terms of use cases in those two directions, the issuance and trading of digital assets and enterprises and consortia building these collaboration networks. I think we're gonna see um, with uh, increased regulation and increased uh, clarity, we're gonna see those two worlds come together. Um, we should have collaboration networks that can issue their own tokens that are tradable on uh, regulated exchanges, especially if they're securities. Um, and we're seeing in the IT industry uh, a granularization of the provision of services. Um, and that's gonna look like trusted transactions, automated agreements on platforms like Ethereum, 
decentralized storage, decentralized bandwidth, decentralized heavy compute. All of that, instead of being um, sold by large sales forces, um, by large um, software corporations, uh, can be um, essentially built and offered on these collaboration networks. And so uh, we'll see smart contract infrastructure enable us to provision for our needs and negotiate and pay for those different kinds of services. And we're going to need financial instruments because on these collaboration networks, there are people doing the validating. Uh, they're lending their storage and compute resources, uh, and they should get paid. And so they're, they're providing services. They need to hedge out their pricing risks. If I'm making use of this infrastructure, I need to hedge out my different risks. And so um, the um, maturation of financial instruments in, in this new emerging digital economy will be incredibly important. So we'll, we'll definitely see those worlds come together. And, and you're talking about like a global client base of individuals who are able to participate in a global economy in a truly granular way. But as we kind of talk to this audience who are all senior executives who are CEOs, who are policymakers and regulators at the highest uh, end of the financial food chain, how are firms, traditional firms, and banks and institutions engaging with enterprise solutions of blockchain? Is there an increasing familiarity? Is there an increasing comfort level? Sure. So all three of us on this panel can answer that. I, I guess I'll start. Um, we are building um, systems, blockchain systems for corporations. We're building um, uh, blockchain systems uh, for exchanges. We're building blockchain systems for consortia. Uh, so uh, the people out in this audience might be part of a, um, something like a commodities trade finance um, blockchain consortium. Uh, we brought together 15 major banks and energy companies into this trading infrastructure that uh, uh, brings tremendous efficiencies. Uh, we're doing uh, supply chain uh, track and trace, um, Procter & Gamble, GlaxoSmithKline. Um, we're enabling consumers to, to scan a product on a, on a shelf and uh, track the provenance of the raw materials from um, es essentially uh, their origin all the way through the manufacturing process. So um, it is uh, essentially coming to probably every organization in time. I expect that most large organizations will participate in probably several, several different uh, blockchain networks that uh, are trusted collaboration platforms for, for getting their work done with other organizations. October 24th, Xi Jinping made his remarks blockchain that really day. kind of created a little seismic shift in blockchain, uh, where uh, com China committed to blockchain as part of the uh, pillars of innovation, uh, of growth for China. That kind of endorsement uh, came at a time uh, that really uh, surprised people, but for those of us who have been reporting on it, who have been experiencing it, uh, it is no surprise. But Yuval, you were just in China. They're very excited to talk to everybody on this stage. Uh, what were some of the conversations that you had in China? What were some of the curiosities, the questions uh, that you would like to share with our audience to give us greater insight? Yeah, so a few things. So first of all, uh, the interesting thing that I saw is uh, actually the willingness even to not just use blockchain within China, but actually to see how you can use this technology outside of China. So how do you actually uh, give access into China from countries outside of China? So I think that you know One Belt, One Road, for example, is, could be a very interesting initiative uh, for deployment of uh, blockchain. I think what we start uh, seeing are exchanges in China, traditional exchanges, that are starting to think about, well, how can we manage collateral that live within China or outside of China to actually allow liquidity to move more quickly between countries? So actually, I think that the speech uh, gives a very good endorsement, but it's also uh, the regulators in China that are actually starting to not just think about how can we digitize the Chinese economy, but also how do we use this technology to give better access both in and out of China. 
And so, David, what do you think the opportunities are? I mean, you're, you're in this region. I think one of the, the key things about R3 is that you're very conscious of what regulators globally and uh, nationally are thinking. I mean, you think about policy in a way that is integrated within the architecture and the design yes. of blockchain implementation. What should this audience be thinking about? Um, well, I, getting back to kind of what Joe said, the R product Corda is kind of on the far right side, but I agree we're going to see these uh, markets come together. I think, uh, and reflecting on a couple other things, is that we're beyond the years of what is blockchain and what is the advantages of blockchain and had debates what distributed ledger technology is versus blockchain, and I now kind of refer to us as, as a distributed computer network that uses smart contracts. But I think what this audience ought to be thinking about is look at the use cases that are live and, and, and in the process of going live. Um, because you don't have to, we don't have to sell blockchain to any of you anymore. We just want to sell solutions to help your business. And the big thing, and, and the easiest way to think about it, is that we all have always solved our firm's issues through our IT spend. But we're part of a larger collaborative industry. We now have this technology that allows us to solve problems at the industry level which brings savings to everyone while still protecting through privacy features, things like our customers and our trade data and the stuff that, that matters to us. So right now, I was just, uh, one of my product guys told me yesterday there's 206 applications on R3. You can go to the R3 marketplace, I'm sure these guys have the same thing, and browse around and see if trade finance works for you, if insurance works for you, if food provenance uh, is of interest to you, or digital ID or KYC. So there's just so much going on out there. Uh, there's got to be something for everybody. And I want to remind the audience that you are also part of this conversation. So please feel empowered to share your questions on the Slido app. Uh, we will be taking your questions. So think about it uh, and think about what um, you really want to dig deep a little bit more uh, from our really a, a powerhouse uh, panel here. Look, they can't all have been winners. We, we've, uh, you've been in this space as veterans uh, for a while. You've built when nobody believed that anything should have been built, quite frankly. And now uh, we are getting to a stage where there's a recognition of not only efficiencies, but inclusion. Uh, what are the experiences of, uh, and the growing pains and the lessons that, that you could share of uh, you know, how, how to also help this audience think about why you're saying what you're saying and how they can sharpen their thinking when they think about blockchain in their own industries and in their own firms. I, can, I mean, I think that there's no difference between any type of technology. I think that uh, four years ago, three years ago, um, your CEO asked the question, what are we doing in blockchain? And effectively, that a bit, a bit smaller scale than, than the president of China saying something like that. But it immediately it sent this rip, ripple effect into the organization where a lot of people on the technology side said, we have to do something in blockchain. So I think that um, some, of the, some of the trends that we're seeing and some of the mistakes that we're now seeing less and less of is, are there really inefficiencies or opportunities that you're seeing in your business that you can transform. And if that's the case, if the answer to that is yes, and I haven't said the word blockchain yes, then you should ask yourself, is the tool called blockchain or DLT applicable to solving this problem? Where I think that four or five years ago, it was the opposite way. We have to use blockchain, and now let's figure out what, what to do with it. So that's one thing. The other thing that we're seeing is that a lot of people associate blockchain with uh, cost saving. A lot of people associate it with how do we reduce costs from our system, uh, where what we're seeing now is actually players, for example, here, here in Hong Kong, we're working with UBS on creating a new traditional asset class, which is structured products. They've been doing it for a long time. But they're actually seeing that by using smart contracts and DLT, they can actually bring new front office revenue that today is hard for them to generate. So they're actually looking at a new opportunity rather than just a cost reduction of how to use this technology. So I think that the, the biggest, the biggest uh, recommendation is think about your business independent of blockchain. Are there things that you can do better? 
and are there opportunities from the specialty of your business that you would want to go after? And then the second question is, should blockchain be the tool that I use to solve these problems? That's a great point because at the end of the day, you have to start from your own needs. Uh, what are your clients' needs? What are your customer needs? What are your needs as a business? And when it comes to finance, uh, there's no doubt that uh, you know, financial institutions take a long-term view. Uh, so questions about uh, upgradability and backwards compatibility come up a lot. Uh, so I'll go back to David here, who's, who's the, the finance guy, the finance veteran. Uh, how do you help explain uh, the technology in these terms? Well, first off, I don't talk about blockchain too much anymore, which right. is a really good sign. I had said two years ago, someone asked me, is when, you know, what does success mean for R3 and its product Corda? And I said, uh, in, in five years' time, and I said, when it's used everywhere and no one knows it. And in some ways, we're, you know, we are, we are getting there already. Um, but as it pertains to large corporations, insurance companies, financial institutions, and, and kind of serious business, you know, we took a very different path four years ago than super cool and very interesting technologies like Ethereum and Bitcoin, and we went down the permissioned uh, pathway and, and were, uh, you know, very uh, specific for the reasons we did that, and that touches on your question, which is, you know, I've spent 30 years, uh, mostly on the trading side, trying to implement technologies into, you know, large uh, corporations and financial institutions, and it's hard. So we looked at how are we gonna integrate, so we made decisions around using Java, we made decisions around using SQL database. I'm not a technology guy, but I contributed one thing early on. I say, keep it simple, make sure it's proven. I was around in the Java years, and I know how long it took for that to integrate into the banking community, so, so, so we aren't that cool, but it works, and it works well for, for certain uh, enterprises. You know, and, and I don't want to limit blockchain or emerging technology or any of these technology tools to just how it's being experienced within enterprise because, Joe, um, you bring up a, a really good point. There is a parallel system that is also evolving in the financial space that is completely separate and distinct from what the world has seen in terms of traditional finance, and that is complete decentralized public blockchain P2P, and what is the promise of that? And so, does this, is this a conflict? Is this something that people in this room should be paying attention to? How are regulators thinking about it? How are you thinking about it? Yeah, so it? we call it open decentralized finance. Um, so once you have your maximally uh, decentralized trust layer, you can put significant assets on, on top of that infrastructure <laughs> and be comfortable uh, that well-resourced actors aren't going to figure out how to cheat that system, how to, how to steal those resources. And so we're seeing on Ethereum now, and it's mostly happening on Ethereum, um, lending borrowing systems, savings accounts, payment systems. Um, tokens representing whole portfolios of tokens so that the whole portfolios can be automatically guaranteed to be rebalanced. Uh, we're seeing licensing systems and subscription systems and synthetic assets and derivatives, uh, prediction markets, and all of these programs are sitting in essentially one computer, one world computer, a single execution space, so they can all um, interact with one another. It's called composability or synergy. And so, so it's not either or, it's interoper interoperability. Yeah, so each of these things can work with each other um, in extremely fluid ways. And so um, you've got a money market system interacting with a different uh, collateralized debt uh, product system. And um, uh, it's driving tremendous innovation. We're seeing the Ethereum network interoperating with the Bitcoin network because the people with Bitcoin want to make use of this financial infrastructure, uh, but they, you can't really do that because Bitcoin's not very programmable. And so there are ways of wrapping Bitcoin and bringing it over to Ethereum so that they can participate as well. Uh, so um, the base trust layer enables this decentralized finance plumbing financial plumbing infrastructure, and on top of that, uh, we think not only is, gonna, is it going to interact with um, 
more traditional financial assets like U.S. Treasuries. People are thinking about putting tr tokenizing Treasuries, sort of wrapping them in a sense and, and making them available to decentralized finance. But once you have that financial infrastructure, then we'll see industries being built on top of that. So Angie, if I, I could jump in, this is where, like I admire a lot of stuff Joe's doing, but I listen to some of this as a guy that's been in finance for so long. And those pipes in finance exist for a reason and they've been laid over the course of the last hundred years with the regulatory wrappers around them and all. So Joe's trying to solve such a bigger problem than we at R3 are trying to solve. You know, we're just, we want to make your businesses work better and cheaper and we want to create revenue opportunities um, and we want to, you know, solve problems at an industry level. So if you think of things that are non-differentiating, non-proprietary, middle and back off services, that you and your trade counterparties are, are doing, or if you're in a, in a supply chain and you need to know who filled out that document and when on a rules-based smart contract and how that brings value to you, that's, that's what we're trying to do. And I think the Ethereum crowd is just trying to do something kind of much more ambitious, which I admire, but is outside of our yeah. focus. So, so we, we do that sort of work as well, but... Um, um, we and tens of thousands of technologists and entrepreneurs are, are trying to build out new, better uh, ways of um, rendering financial services, uh, making them permissionless in some cases, uh, making them global, building a global settlement layer uh, for assets. And the legacy financial world came from somewhere. Uh, it wasn't always um, as um, broadly and rigorously yeah, yeah, yeah. regulated, and so it was like you, a thousand you, you, years, Joe. It was like over a thousand more, yeah, several I, thousands I know, but, of years. But I innovation has to start somewhere, and we pay a lot of attention to, to regulation. But uh, um, it's a powerful new technology, and each jurisdiction around the world is going to have to have conversations with the technologists, with the regulators about how essentially what is acceptable of this technology in, uh, in each jurisdiction. It's kind of like media. I'll just jump in and say it could be a pen to paper or it could be uh, uh, word programming on computer. Uh, it could be old time radio. It could be digital. I mean, these are really tools, but in the hands of people. And this is what we're talking about here because these systems are all made up. And to David's point, it evolved over thousands of years, but it was still made up by the vision of men and women of human civilization. So we fast forward to today, and this is yet just another tool. So how are you going to use this tool that truly empowers you in an extraordinary way, and not just blockchain, but all of these emerging technologies. We're hearing incredible uh, innovations in quantum technology, in AI, in IoT, in 5G, in cloud. I could go on, but I'll let you ask the questions. Uh, let me ask this one question from the crowd. Uh, corporates in Asia are studying prototyping enterprise blockchain at a small scale. Enterprise-wide implementation seem far off. What's stopping them? I, I can take that. I actually think that Asia is actually pretty active. So if, it, if it's starting from uh, the project that we're doing in Australia, which is close to Asia, effectively replacing an entire G10 country, entire equity infrastructure. So just, just put that into perspective. In 2020, the Australian market is actually going to test a production system that is going to manage all cash equities in Australia. Uh, I mentioned UBS is very active, uh, BNP, uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange has been very active. You're seeing the regulator talking about, uh, about uh, some of the regulatory framework around virtual assets. So I actually think that uh, Asia is um, actually doing some very impressive, yeah. impressive projects here in Asia. I, I think that, and there's, there's a similar question about like, is there tangible data and why is it taking so long? So I just want to put things into perspective. We all started building the technology stack about four or five years ago. Um, the internet that was started in you know, 60s all the way to the 90s 
really start seeing the value that gets created actually post the dot com really starting to, to capture it. And I'm not saying that it's going to take 30 to 40 years to see blockchain uh, show its, its value, but I actually am seeing a lot of customers here in Asia, but uh, David can talk about uh, very exciting projects that they're doing in Europe, US, and also here in Asia. You're actually seeing clients really understanding how they can use this technology to really transform their business, and it will take time it takes time to deploy these things in a way that people can trust it, that the regulator can trust it, that the customers can trust it. But I do think that within the next year or two, you're actually going to start seeing data come out of these systems. Yeah, yeah. so just real quickly, because um, is Siam Cement Company, for example, largest conglomerate in Thailand, has put their entire procurement system on quarter. They claim it's cut their cost by 50%. I think there's 5,000. Uh, of their customers on that. And actually in Japan, we're actually seeing the corporates focusing on trade, finance, supply chain, food provenance, driving the bank's activities and not the other way around. So I'm with Yuval, and I think Asia kind of deserves more credit. Uh, they're, they're more, uh, I find they're more willing to take risk and try things on, and we've seen some really cool stuff out here. Yeah, so we have uh, two um, prominent projects in Asia um, and several others around the world. Uh, the first is a private equity exchange. Um, it's, it's, I would say it's based in Singapore, but it's not really because it's on the public mainnet of Ethereum, but it is regulated by the Monetary Authority of Singapore. So it's called One Exchange. We built it with a, a company called Capbridge. Uh, the second um, very significant success is a project that we did with Union Bank in the Philippines. It's called Eye to Eye. It's essentially an international remittance system. Uh, so clearing and settlement uh, across islands uh, takes days and, or has been taking days and weeks uh, for, for citizens. And uh, essentially we onboarded, I think there's over 100 um, essentially local mini banks uh, um, onto the system to enable uh, effectively real-time uh, payments, clearing and settlement so that uh, uh, people uh, can move money uh, to their family members much more efficiently. That's a huge issue here in, in Asia. As you know, remittances make up for some economies a, a very critical part. Cross-border transactions are, are the lifeblood uh, for a lot of sovereigns in, in this region. Um, and so the, the regulatory space is, is going to be part of an important uh, aspect of this conversation. Uh, I'd like to ask a, another question that one of our uh, audience members provided, uh, asking all of you if you could provide and discuss implement implications on regulatory capital requirements on securities custody and settlement as blockchain develops in the next five years. Uh, Dave, Dave, that's you. <laughs> David, that's all you. Who, okay. Whose question is that? No, that's, no, that's a, a great, that's a really good question. It's a, it's a great question. And, and I mean, I, I, what was the question, what the impact will be? I think the first thing is, the impact, there's, a yeah. lot of, there's a lot of work going on in the custodianship of digital assets, which is important for all of us. And, and some of the largest uh, financial firms in the world are really focusing on that. In part, you mentioned UBS, you know, a lot of this is driven by their private wealth guys that want a little exposure to, to Joe's Ether and to other, uh, other cryptocurrencies and, and the like. But listen, the, the, and I don't know if you noticed in uh, uh, the comments, uh, Joe and I were talking about having insurance on exchanges and all, that's gonna be very expensive. So we're gonna feel our way through this. It's not gonna be resolved overnight. Um, and if you think about how difficult it is to figure out, uh, you know, how to, uh, you know, uh, what math you used to, to figure out that question, it's uh, going to take a while. Yeah, and I, I think, answer. Yeah, go, so. go for it. I think, I think that the, the reason why I love this question, because uh, what Corda is doing with HQLX, but really if you think about what, what is blockchain, it's certainty around data. Uh, where it lives in real time. What is a capital requirement? It's how do you manage risk because of settlement risk. So I actually think that if anything, this is super exciting for capital requirements. Uh, we were working with some dealers that are actually saying, if we actually put our treasury management system on a blockchain and we can know in real time where we have our cash and actually prove to the regulator in literally milliseconds 
which entity has how much capital, I actually think that it will help relieve as long as you take the regulator, of course, on the journey with you. I think that that's one very interesting, very interesting aspect. But then a lot of people talk about real-time gross settlement, and this is, goes back to my point, do you understand the business? Because whoever talks about real-time gross settlement doesn't necessarily understand what market makers do, which market makers do not like real-time gross settlement. So I think that it's really understanding what are the implications of the technology on different parts of the market, but specifically for capital requirements, I think this is very exciting. Yeah, so um, aspects of securities laws are about protecting the consumer, in some cases from the custodian of their assets, and uh, in a context where you can participate um, trading or otherwise being exposed to different financial instruments without giving up custody of your underlying assets, that has huge implications for, um, for how securities law is constructed in the future. And so uh, we, as the technology gets more mature and better understood, we're going to have some really interesting discussions about uh, um, how securities law should evolve. And so we've got 30 seconds left and about 30 questions here. So I'll tell Let's you what I'm going to do. <laughs> Let's go. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Okay. I'm going to get the organizers to collect these questions. And we're going to continue this conversation on forecast news. I'm going to share my platform with this audience, with you guys. Is your platform on a blockchain? Because if not, we're, we're not doing it. We've got guys. the best <laughs> of blockchain on Forecast News, as evidenced by these three gentlemen here. Thank you so much to our panelists. And I'm going to commit all of you to answering these questions, OK? So we'll tag you on social media. Come join us. But um, I, I can't even tell you how many more questions we have. Angie, would you ever consider a sales role at R3? You're one of the best <laughs> salespeople I've ever met in my life. Global head of Asian sales, for example. You know, you know, what, I, you know what I truly want to sell? Or, the uh, fact that technology is truly a human tool, that we can be intimidated by the technology, the digitalization, the assets, the vernacular that circles and envelops this technology. But if you can simply understand that this is a tool for you in the way that you are, in the way that you're already thinking, in the way that you're already experiencing, this is simply another tool that can honestly create a much more efficient, greater future. Thank you to all of you thank for you. Thank you. using these tools. Thank you. And thank you to all of you.